uh, we are uh, pleased to announce that we got a guest from a very well renowned institute of course uh, it's my institute where i did my post graduation so one of my uh, teacher one of my elder sister uh, dr judy john she is going to speak on behalf of uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, on the topic of gait analysis and its clinical aspect so uh, i just introduce uh, dr judy she has been uh, uh, very supportive for post graduation training and she has been uh, i have been with her uh, working uh, in initial uh, few years of my career she has been really supportive and she has a thorough understanding about pmr and various aspects so uh, we uh, we requested her if she can she she throw some light because cnc is known to do some work on gait analysis they have been doing it for last many years so i requested uh, uh, dr judy uh, she is working as a professor and also unit head so she uh, i requested if she can present and she thankfully uh, accepted our invitation so i i'll request dr judy jong ma'am to please uh, start up with your presentation we are also having our hod uh, dr pavitra sir so uh, th uh, we have uh, more other guests also and i hope we'll very soon time we are not other people will be joining uh, ma'am we can start if you can hear me we can start ma'am yeah uh, yeah dr abhishek i can hear you and good evening to you and to everyone it's really uh, very nice to connect virtually i like i was mentioning to uh, dr uh, pavitra i'm very anxious about a uh, virtual present uh, presentation and class because um, as a teacher i i really look for some kind of feedback and interaction with the pgs and i think that is what um teachers also need some you know inspiration to teach so i hope there are some pgs here i i i know this is a wonderful work that has been started by dr pavitra saho and uh, dr abhishek um who is uh, um a graduate from here it's wonderful to see the seeds uh little seeds which have been sown here in cmc um going out and you know um doing such wonderful work i was just mentioning to dr uh, pavitra how there's excellent work that is happening in the departments of pmr in the rest of the country and yes in cmc uh, gate analysis is something which uh, i have grown up um with right from my post graduate uh, days thanks to dr suranjan Uh, but to charge and i think this is just an opportunity to share a little bit of what i think is very 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 crucial for any physiatrist um so i'm just going to begin uh, i assure you we will not take more than 40 minutes it is not easy for you all to sit through a very long presentation so i am just going to share my screen and uh, i look forward to the pgs interacting so uh please be kind to me and uh, unmute and um put your videos on so i can just know that you're listening and you're and uh we are all going to kind of at least use the next 40 minutes um in a meaningful way i'm just going to how do i um slide show you have to make a slide show ma'am it will be it's already visible well the okay. down square box you have to make a slide show um yeah so shall i just stop sharing i'll put it in the slide show mode and then i'll come is there on the right side or not huh is it is it in slide sh uh, slide show no the slides are not visible now it's uh. just you are visible now so you have to share your slides now once again Okay, one minute. Sorry. So, share screen. Yeah, is it in slideshow? No, it is in uh, not in slideshow. There is in the if you look to the right side lower button, there is a glass-like picture. Yes, that one. Yeah, that one. That one. Click on that. Okay. All right. Fine. all right so we we are going to look at fundamentals in gait analysis and what i'm hoping through this uh time we will understand the role of clinical gait analysis 
we will be able to describe a normal gait cycle and its phases, and we will become familiar with the determinants of gait. And also, what are the different ways of measuring gait? Okay, so now is the time, just anybody, can you just tell me what is clinical gait analysis? Just someone, just for me to connect and know that there is, there are some PGs who are there um, and who are listening. What is, in just in your word, words, what is clinical and gait analysis? Yeah, so I'm going to wait till someone speaks. Anything, anything, just anything about what you think is gait analysis. Any PG from uh, with your own words, you can explain. Amit? Hello? Yeah, it's audible. Yes, yeah. ah, Amit? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, gait analysis, I think, is mostly uh, analysis of the movement during walking as well as uh, on, uh, running or climbing stairs. Like that. Okay. Thank you very much. So, you're absolutely right. It is just analyzing uh, the movement. So, I would put it as three parts to gait analysis. One is you're recording the movement. Second is you're measuring it. And the third is you're finding a way to interpret what you are recording and measuring. And you are using this information to support or decide on how you want to improve the person's gait. Excellent. Thank you. Now, what, when can we use clinical gait analysis? Absolutely right. So any thoughts about when we can use this? I said it's important, but do you think it's important in your learning or in your practice? Any thoughts? I think PGs can be more active to uh, answer so that it becomes a more uh, two-directional uh, rather than a just a unidirectional presentation. Yeah, thing is you all know, so it's just becoming comfortable saying uh, and thinking through um, that is this presentation. So when 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 do you think uh, the assessment or measurement of walking pattern can make a difference? Whenever we see a patient uh, with abnormal gait, we can go for this analysis to see where exactly they are affected in the gait cycle. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so you can always do a baseline objective measurement for anyone who has a gait impairment. So when they come in walking to your outpatient clinic and you find that there's a gait deviation and you want to um, you want to analyze that to find out the reason or you want to have an objective initial measurement, you want to see and recognize what are the different gait patterns in this particular child or in this person with stroke. You want to plan an intervention. You want to see what is the outcome of your intervention. And you want to compare gait, you know, in fact, our uh, PMS speciality has grown so much with the technology uh, in multiple areas, uh, even for orthosis and prosthesis, you know, different kinds of AFO. Even today I had uh, our orthotic prosthetic person saying there's dynamic AFO, there's energy storing AFO, there is leaf spraying. Now, uh, um, there you find that, that in the market, there are so, ex there are many expensive um, orthosis and processes coming out. And if you want to decide for your patients, what is the best and most effective orthosis? It may be even a small modification of the footwear. You know, you can always use an objective way for and, and analyze the gait with um, each of these or what you think is biomechanically appropriate for, the, for your patient. And you can monitor progress and change uh, over time, you can predict outcome for any uh, condition which is affecting gait or any intervention that you have used. So there are multiple um, roles uh, of gait analysis. And uh, of late, there are various studies which are showing that 
instrumental gait analysis is uh, making an impact in terms of decision making uh, for clinicians in a variety of conditions, particularly cerebral palsy, uh, brain injury, stroke, uh, and in amputee rehab. Now, uh, what is gait cycle? So can someone just kind of describe in your own words, what is a gait cycle? Ma'am, it is a, a series where we document the movement during walking. So from the beginning of walk to till the end. Okay, excellent. All right, so now you have to become more specific when you describe what is beginning, what is end. So in uh, when we talk about a gait cycle, we always say the gait cycle begins with heel strike, sorry, with heel strike or the initial contact. Can you see my mouse? Is my mouse visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you always say the gait cycle begins with heel strike or initial contact and the leg goes through its phase of stance, goes to the toe off and the body moves forward and the same leg comes back to the initial contact. Okay, so this stance phase of 60% and swing phase of 40% of gait cycle is what you call and you define as the beginning and the end of a gait, gait cycle, okay? And this is also called a stride length. Okay, so this is again uh, for you to see that very clearly, um, how the one foot is coming at initial contact and then it goes through the stance phase, goes to the swing phase and goes back to the initial contact. So when we, are say, when we say we are trying to analyze the gait, we are literally assessing each and every movement that happens through all these phases of gait cycle. And you're doing it for each of the legs. You're doing it for your right lower limb as well as for the left lower limb. Now we'll go on to see uh, what are the phases of gait cycle. I think all of you are very clear about the stance and the swing phase. Can anyone tell me what are the different phases of, there was a little bit of hint in the other uh, previous slide, but what were, what are the phases? The tasks are, you know, each of them have a very specific role. Um, some of it we have been able to understand and that's why we say that each of the phase is very crucial in um, the evaluation of gait. So any thoughts on what are the phases? Uh, Ma'am, initial, initial contact, contact then mid-stance, mid -stance, terminal stance, stance in case of stance phase, and then pre-swing, mid-swing, and terminal swing in swing phase. Okay, excellent. So we'll just go, thra go through that very fast. Okay, so the role of that initial contact and loading response is weight acceptance, and that is also called a double limb support. So there's 10% of your gait cycle goes in the weight acceptance or the initial double limb support. Okay, the remaining 10% is in the pre-swing phase of the gait. And after that is the single limb support. Okay, so Perry has described a few prerequisites of a normal gait. And the pre-positioning of the feet when you begin your gait is very important for the weight acceptance. So one of the important prerequisites is the preposition which tells you about the weight acceptance and the second prerequisite is how stable is the person on the single limb support which is 40 percent of your gait cycle uh, both the mid stance and the terminal stance and the third prerequisite for a normal gait cycle is your swing limb advancement so if you have a good swim limb advancement then it says that your uh, step length, which again is a fourth prerequisite, will be good and your stride length will be good. So each of these uh, faces with a very specific task for making our gait efficient. And the swing phase itself is divided into the initial swing, mid swing and the terminal swing. Now we'll just go on to the details because I think what really has helped us here is 
you know, doing the instrumental gait analysis and understanding these terminologies has really helped us uh, improve our abilities to observe uh, a gait, uh, even though we do not send everybody for an instrumental gait analysis, just the observation of these movements and uh, understanding um, their role has, uh, has enabled us to understand how we can improve gait with intervention. So going on to the weight acceptance, what happens is the initial contact is with the heel. At this position, the hip is in flexion, 25 degrees of flexion. The knee is usually extended and at the most in a five degree flexion, ankle is in neutral, okay? So that's the initial contact. When we go on to the loading response, we find that the ankle, which is in neutral, goes into plantar flexion. And that is a phase when the tibialis anterior is actually eccentrically contracting, okay? And that is like a shock absorber. And the quadriceps muscles is again lengthening. There's eccentric contraction of the quadriceps because of which the knee is flexed. So this helps with shock absorption and it helps the body prepare itself for the next phase, which is the single limb support and mid stance. So we find the hip is now coming from uh, 25 degree of flexion and it'll gradually go on to a neutral position. The knee which is flexed will kind of, will go and become straight, will go into zero degree or into a neutral position and the ankle will move from a plantar flexion. It'll go flow posteriorly slowly and it'll start moving to a neutral. And as terminal stance happens, you can see what is a neutral ankle will gradually go from five degrees of dorsiflexion to a 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. So you can see that there is movement of dorsiflexion happening because the tibia is falling forward. Okay, so the dorsiflexion is happening before because the tibia is falling forward. Now this is a very important uh, movement for the gait because the gastronemus muscle is eccentrically contracting and that is where the power of your uh, gait happens. So the push off or the toe off happens because you know, like a rubber band, it is stretched. And when you let go, the amount of energy needed for getting that propulsion is uh, very efficient. So uh, the dorsiflexion happening, again, remember these words are very important because we need to understand tibialis anterior is not working to get this uh, dorsiflexion to happen. Or this is what we call the second rocker. It is actually the gastronemius that is stretching and helping out with the push off. And that again, if you understand the importance of this, you will realize that when you have someone, even a particular child who has a spastic diplegia and you weaken the gastronemius muscle, you can worsen the crouch gait. So gastronemias, even though we think it is a muscle which causes a lot of problems in many of uh, the conditions that we see, it's a very, we need to understand it's a very important muscle in the gait cycle, giving uh, the, the power generation is, the maximum power generation is from the gastronemias. Uh, and the terminal stance phase is when the gastronemous muscle gets ready for the next phase, which we call the pre-swing and the push off. So pre-sing, again, what is happening is the gastronemus is going into a concentric contraction. And at this point, the knee is getting flexed. So remember the gastronemus has an origin um, uh, above the knee. And I just want to kind of uh, just remind you when we talk about gastronemus, uh, it is helping with the knee flexion in the second rocker. It is the soleus, which is helping with the tibia from falling forward, okay? So the pre-swing phase, the gastronemia is helping with the knee flexion. Again, remember at this phase, uh, I will go on to show you the EMG, but the hamstrings are not acting to get the knee to flex. In fact, at this phase, the next power generation is done by your hip flexes. So just with the gastronemia and the hip flexion, the propulsion of the leg is happening. And you can see that the initial swing phase is when the knee is in maximum knee in maximum flexion, hip is also born into flexion, the ankle is moving from 20 degrees of plantar flexion and it's slowly going on to 
become neutral in the mid swing phase and the amount of knee flexion is coming down so the measurement of the angles is you have to extend the uh, femur down and you have to calculate the angle of uh, between the extension of the line from the femur and the tibia that what gives you the angle of the knee okay hip angle is down straight here and uh, with the femur and a vertical line down but when you talk about the knee angle it is in relation to the femur okay and the terminal swing remember uh, this is a deceleration phase and actually the hamstring is acting to control the uh, the uh, the extension of the knee so the amount of force that is generated in the swing phase now the hamstring is controlling the knee extension so that the leg is ready to go on to the initial contact and receive uh, go on to the phase where the body is going to accept weight on that leg so that's the terminal swing okay so uh, i've just put it together because you just have to become familiar and keep looking at these images so you can look at what happens at uh, through all these phases okay so initial contact neutral ankle everything is straight uh, ankle goes into plantar flexion so remember this is plantar flexion so this is neutral and this is plantar flexion eccentric contraction of the tibialis anterior mid stance uh, none of your muscles are working except um, just about your gastrocnemius which is eccentrically contracting then the pre swing uh, where yeah I, i should always say soleus okay so the soleus is kind of eccentrically contracting along with the gastrocnemius in the terminal stance and then the pre swing and the initial swing when the feet is off the ground and the knee is in in, in a good knee flexion that is helping you give that is helping with the clearance foot clearance and then ankle coming to neutral and then getting ready for the next phase of um, the gait cycle with a good pre positioning of the uh, feet uh, with the uh, initial contact with the heel okay so remember there are three rockers and we will come on to see the reason why these rockers are very important but what we call the heel rocker which is the first rocker the second rocker is when the ankle goes into dorsiflexion which we call the ankle rocker and then the four foot rocker where actual plantar flexion is happening okay we'll see the importance of this subsequently yes so these are the uh, now we'll go on to what are the determinants of gait efficiency now we have gone into all these detail because um these um various movements that happen in the hip knee and ankle are to make our gait very efficient and we will just look at it uh, now uh, the center of mass moves as we walk we know that the center of mass is anterior to our s uh, anterior to s2 uh, so the as we walk the center of mass moves both vertically as well as horizontally and your gait is going to be efficient if this movements is as minimal as possible so if the lateral displacement is less than 2 cm uh, is less than 5 4 cm and the vertical displacement is less than 2 cm then your gait is uh, efficient the more it moves uh, uh, vertically and horizontally uh, the amount of energy that is required to walk is much more uh, if you want to kind of describe it biomechanically um, uh, we know that it is during the mid stance and the mid swing phase of gait cycle that your center of gravity is at the highest peak so this is just for you to imagine suppose you are you didn't have a pelvis that would allow rotation or you didn't have all these movements that we describe both in the knee and in the ankle at various phases of gait cycle your uh, center of mass would be you know going up and down uh, and um, the uh, center of gravity uh, goes lowest during the double limb support that is during the loading phase and the pre swing phase and uh, 
the determinants of gait that have been described by Inam et al. are the pelvic rotation, the pelvic uh, tilt, or the what we call the Trendelberg, which is there to a small extent uh, when we walk, and um, the interactions that I described with the knee, ankle, and the foot, and what we call the physiological genu valgus. So um, remember, when we are walking, uh, during the stance phase, there is a small uh, small drop in the opposite, opposite side. Remember, it's a very controlled drop because your abductors on the stance phase are controlling that drop. But that drop is very important to prevent the COG going up too high. Okay. Similarly, you have your um, stance phase knee flexion. Okay. So that... It, uh, your pelvis doesn't go too high during your mid stance phase. Okay, now your center of gravity going too low is prevented by your rotations. Okay, so uh, when we progress our leg, if our pelvis, pelvis didn't rotate, then our center of gravity would go very low. But we are getting that extra length or we're getting a good step length without our center of gravity uh, falling too low and that's because our pelvis is able to rotate so i think this is the pelvis it's able to rotate forward and backward okay and um, there are these what we talked about the rockers okay the heel rocker and uh, the first rocker second rocker again all these movements that are happening are again to prevent the uh, center of gravity falling too low during our, uh, during the initial contact. So the movements that happen during the uh, loading response as well as during the terminal and the pre-swing. All these are again to prevent the center of uh, gravity falling too low uh, during the gait cycle. Okay, so and then this is what I mentioned about uh, preventing too much of lateral shift. There is a mild genu valgus and our, our pelvis movement is uh, of the pelvis is very crucial in preventing the um, uh, preventing uh, the lateral shift during our amylation. Okay, so now that we've understood the different phases and uh, we've understood what are some basic terminologies that we need to understand for efficiency of gait. Um, so how do we measure gait? Any thoughts on how do we measure gait? What are the different ways we can use? Gate measuring parameters. Sorry, what parameters? Sorry, come again? No, no, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, PG, Steffi. Oh, okay. Somebody can come forward. What are the gate measuring parameters? Or just how can we measure? How can we measure? Go. So we uh, will be measuring in terms of stride length, step length, stride width, and cadence. Okay. okay. Is that, that what you are asking, ma'am? Absolutely. Yeah. You have. To, you can have different ways of measuring. You are absolutely right. You can use uh, spatiotemporal parameters by just uh, measuring their stride length. But how would you do it? Uh, Ma'am, by observational and also videography and by computerized. Okay, so yes. So Instrument and gait analysis. You're absolutely right, you know. So all that you need is a phone. Okay. Okay, now in my OPD, I tell some other family to just record their gait. And uh, uh, there are softwares which are now available freely where you can use that um, to just calculate the angle. Okay, so that's absolutely right. Your observational gait analysis uh, is important. And when I say observational gait analysis, you need to record it. That's the, that is the most important part. Now, why do we need to record it? Somebody's coming in the you know, OPD. I can just uh, observe and, you know, I've learned so much and I know so much. I can quickly make a note of, um, you know, all the, you know, there is a problem with the initial contact. You know, it's like the, the initial contact is with the forefoot. Uh, the swing face is not good because the knee flexion is good. Uh, is not very good. I can make a note of it, but why do we need to record it? Uh, 
ma'am first we need to get a baseline uh, parameters then afterwards uh, if we do some kind of intervention then we have to check what actually uh, the patient got benefited from it so that's why yeah yeah so we don't have a com like a memory that is of a computer so whatever we write down you know it's very very difficult to capture the details and uh, whatever intervention you do when they come to you a couple of months later it's very difficult to actually you know remember uh, just by looking at your notes uh, what difference the intervention has made yes patient will probably tell you i'm able to walk better or you can have other six minute walk tests and other things that you can do but um, if you really want to study then some way of recording the gait and also like you said if you can have some measurement of these ranges uh, of the joint during his various gait that will be that will be the ideal so um, yeah this is again just to tell you that uh, the measurement can be done even with your with an observational gait and i think that has become a very important part of our pg training where you know we have this form which we have made and we just um, have a gait analysis meeting every monday and uh, they have to the on the saturday afternoon they sit one of them has to look and analyze and do the measurements and draw uh, a member show um, and kind of compare it with the quantitative or with the uh, with the quantitative gait analysis that we have here uh, in uh, in our lab here so using a sagittal way by which you are looking at the hip knee ankle as well as looking at the gait uh, posteriorly and anteriorly to see what's happening in the pelvis you know is there a pelvic drop and also you know i will I mean, in the video i will show you when you look at it from the frontal view you can see what's happening to the um, are there any um, rotations happening in the femur or the tibia or what are what is happening in the feet are there any varus or a valgus uh, deviations in the feet so those details you will get only when you look at it uh, from the frontal point of view uh, anteriorly and posteriorly so that's very good so we can the observational gait analysis is definitely uh, something which uh, all of us as physiatrists will need to become comfortable with quantitative gait analysis for a few patients who where the facility is available and uh, this is just going to, i'm just going to run through a little bit of uh, the uh, when you talk about quantitative quantitative gait analysis you are capturing the spatial temporal data you are going capturing the kinematic data uh, that is what we have already seen in terms of the movement that is happening in each of the joints in various phases of the gait cycle we are looking at emg activity that is happening in the each of the phases in each of these phases of gait cycle we are looking at uh, what is happening with regard to kinetics or the Uh, energy or the forces that are acting across each of these joint and at the end if you want to just sum it up you want to see how efficient you can use different ways of assessing uh, the energy cost of your walking so yes um, your spatial temporal uh, parameters uh, that we get through gait analysis is your step length stride length the step width and this is again you know we have to have normative data uh, if you have a gait lab and these are things that we have Uh, from the um, normals that we have um, done uh, to know i mean to, from in our gait lab um, and uh, the single limb support again telling you you know how stable is the person when he is walking in his uh, single limb stance now the cameras uh, are there to capture uh, the markers so you know we have markers which are placed on the metatarsal Uh, head laterally the calcaneum the lateral malleoli the tibia um uh, sorry the fibula the lateral uh, femoral condyle the trochanter and uh, the anterior superior iliac spine uh, and these are uh, these uh, are used this information that is captured by the camera is used to uh, calculate the kinematics and these are the graphs that we get uh, so i'm just going to run it, run you Uh, through this graph so that you know you can just become familiar with uh, the um, quantitative gait analysis that we uh, get so this is again the initial contact okay we so i just wanted to become familiar with this uh, this graph so the blue is the stance the yellow is the swing and what you see below is zero and above is dorsiflexion and below is plantar flexion okay 
So the initial contact is usually when the ankle is in neutral. And when you go to loading response, it goes from a neutral to a plantar flexion, which is your first rocker. Then you're getting ready for the second rocker. So mid stance, it goes to neutral and neutral to dorsiflexion to remember dorsiflexion terminal stance. This is your ankle going into uh, dorsiflexion, which is your second rocker. And then the third rocker where your ankle is now going into plantar flexion and then your push off where your where you enter the swing phase and then in the initial swing phase the ankle is going from uh, plantar flexion to gradually moving towards neutral and getting ready for the next phase of gait cycle okay so this is just to reinforce and for you to understand how the uh, how how the graphs are um, how the graphs are represented uh, in a uh, gait analysis report and this is the knee. I haven't gone to the details, but like I said, initially during the loading response, there is. Okay, so this again is uh, flexion on the top and extension below swing, sorry, stance face is a blue and yellow is the swing face. So there's an initial knee flexion during the loading response and then it goes into neutral and during the swing phase, uh, from the pre-swing phase, the knee starts flexing and you have the maximum amount of knee flexion in the initial swing and then knee coming back into extension to get ready for the next cycle, gait cycle. Okay, So hip, initial contact, you're beginning in flexion and then going down to um, neutral at the most a five degree of extension in terminal stance and five to 10 degree and then going back into flexion. Okay, so these are your kinematic data. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the uh, EMG recordings are done. Uh, in our setup, we are able to record uh, the tibialis anterior gastrocnemius rectus is uh, what we're using as capturing what happened as a hip flexor, okay and the glutea muscle, glutea muscles and the vastus lateralis. So when we get our graphs, we are able to get multiple strides, but we like to concentrate and assess each gait cycle. And like I mentioned, uh, we have the gastrocnemius, which is the one which is coming on eccentrically and then concentrically to help with the push off phase for the swing. And remember, um, tibialis anterior, like I mentioned, no, it's acting eccentrically. You know? So even though the ankle is going into plantar flexion, it's acting eccentrically in that loading response. And then yes, in the swing phase where your uh, the feet is coming from a plantar flexion to a neutral position to help with the clearance. Vastus lateralis, again, remember, you know, usually we think quadriceps muscle is there for knee extension, but our gait is such an efficient and beautifully um, I mean, uh, beautifully created in a way that you know our uh, we are we are walking so efficiently, and again that is because of the role of the eccentric muscles which are happening during the knee flexion. Okay, so knee flexion. Remember, vastus lateral is acting. Yes, uh, there is some amount of needle hamstring, but this is mainly as a hip extensor. That again, you know, uh, we have learned so much. You know, because again in CP there was a lot about uh, lengthening the hamstring, but then we realize when you lengthen the hamstrings, the stability of the hip is affected because ha needle hamstring in many ways eccentrically contracts during the, uh, uh, the initial contact loading response to provide a controlled, um, uh, controlled loading phase of the gait. And um, again, you see because the center of gravity is passing very, very smoothly, the vastus lateralis is not really coming on except for that eccentric contraction of your uh, of the loading response where it acts like a shock absorber. And look at this middle hamstring, where middle hamstring is acti actually acting in that deceleration phase where the knee is extending so that the leg is ready for the next phase of gait cycle. Again, glutei, uh, more of eccentric contraction. Yeah, so you would think, you know, hip is inflection. Okay, why is the why is the gluteus acting when the hip is in flexion? No, hip is in maximum flexion in the initial contact terminal, uh, sorry, initial contact loading response. You know? 
but uh, it is eccentrically contracting. It is providing stability during the as the leg moves from the uh, into that uh, into well, from the loading response to the mid stance. And again, rectus femoris, like I mentioned, is uh, what we use to record hip flexors. So as is very deep muscles, so we are not able to record it with surface electrodes. So rectus is the one which is uh, telling us that the hip flexors are coming on to help with that initial swing phase. Okay, so kinetics is really measuring the ground reaction force at each joint and calculating the muscle activity or the soft tissue resistance to stabilize the joint. Now, I won't go really into this, but I just want you to understand concepts, you know, because uh, when we stand, it's just about the gastronemias that we are using um, and the center of gravity is passing in a way that we don't need to use any muscles. But uh, remember when we are walking, our uh, center of gravity is moving very, very beautifully uh, posterior to the ankle and then anterior to the ankle, but all the time in a way that we don't have to use the muscles very much. Okay, so this information is captured because of a force plate. Okay, so that force plate and the ground reaction force really helps us get the information, what we call as moments. Now, this is again just to show you that each phase we have normal moments and the power generation which is calculated uh, for the ankle for the knee and for the hip uh, which again tells you what is happening across each joint uh, the finally you know is we do this very simple physiological cost index where you just subtract the walking heart rate from the resting heart rate and divide it by the walking speed okay so uh, yeah, so I think we've learned a lot just by discussing um, our, uh, or, like I said, the PGs do the observational gait analysis and then we look at what is captured and we do a lot of learning. We just have five men, I mean, I, I think we just will need to wind up. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure whether we have time to go. Uh, the the gait pattern is, um, like a hemiplegic, you know, you will have to even decide whether it is a, you know, just a drop foot or a true equinus, or is it an equinus with recurvatum? Is it a jump knee? Okay, so you can have equinus with recur recurvatum, or you can have a jump knee, or you can have a type four hemi which has got more involvement of the proximal parts of the hip, and that is why I said the frontal examination is important, where you will know what's happening in terms of. Uh, the femur, whether it is internally rotated or adducted. Uh, so the temporospatial uh, parameters, again, you know, hemiplegic, you can pick up and say, okay, the single limb support on the left side is on the lower side and your physiological cost index. Uh, again, we have our normals, uh, but single limb support on the left side is lesser than the single limb support on the normal side, you know, so these are things which you can pick up and see how the intervention changes. Again, these are graphs which will, which have, which will again, right side is what we have for the normal side. I mean, at least what appears normal in our observational gait analysis. And on the left side where the ankle is in equinus, not much of movement, uh, but interesting is the, uh, the EMG is showing you that tibialis anterior is acting. So even though there's no movement, tibialis anterior is acting. And gastronemias, uh, in fact, on the right side, which is the normal side, there is some abnormal activity. Uh, so, yeah, so again, remember we, we are, this child definitely looked like a hemiplegic, but always uh, when we do a gait analysis, we find that there is some impairment, even the normal side in terms of the moments and the power generation. So you can plan your therapy accordingly. This child uh, needed um, uh, casting and antispastic and AFO. Uh, so you can see there's some amount of knee flexion uh, when the person is walking, but we see the moments are in silence. So it was a primary problem in the, uh, so it's a jump knee, but the primary problem was in the ankle. And just with the intervention, of uh, at, at the level of the ankle with medications, with casting and AFO uh, and therapy. This is, uh, I mean, he had a significant improvement.
we have, we've reached the end, end of our uh, time, but I just want to leave this time for any, 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 um, anybody who wants to ask things, but. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, uh, just uh, some uh, queries from my side. Uh, there are a lot of controversies regarding this uh, hamstring part. You said just that uh, it's role in just decelerating during the swing stage. Uh, swing phase of the gait. So, what uh, a wrist part of the uh, cycle? They, uh, what, do you, what is their measure? Because we find a lot of controversy during hamstring lengthening, planning for hamstring lengthening. Mm -hmm. Still, uh, people are saying that uh, in especially in case of Kraut's gait, whether to go for hamstring lengthening or not. Uh, if you are lengthening, then what muscle is your target? Uh, like many times we transfer semi to anterior to just to uh, take out the, spa, the spastic component and also to augment the hip extensor by Sutherland's procedure. But uh, controversy again arises from lengthening of the semimembranous muscles or not, uh, gracilis or not. So these controversies are still uh, lying with us. We are not able to solve it. What way you can throw a light that uh, we can decide uh, in which place uh, this gait cycle will be helpful for deciding to go for hamstring lengthening or not. So far, we have uh, taken a one clinical criteria. If the child is having an anterior pelvic tilt, we don't go for in hamstring lengthening. That exaggerates the anterior pelvic tilt and uh, also secondary affects the gait. So, so far, we have limitations only in that condition. When there is excessive anterior pelvic tilt, so don't go for hamstring lengthening. But in other conditions, still, the doubt is with us, controversy is with us. What do you suggest? Uh, yeah, so um, what you said is very right. This anterior pelvic tilt is uh, definitely something which, you know, sometimes the popliteal angle that is measured is not very accurate. So they say that now we should do a, 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 what is what we call as a double popliteal angle. So you, when we want to check the uh, popliteal angle of one side, so if I'm if I'm checking the popliteal angle of the right lower limb, I have to completely flex the left hip because if okay. there's an anterior pelvic tilt, if yes, I completely yes. flex my left hip then I sometimes find what I've got as a popliteal angle of 60 suddenly becomes 30 degrees. Yes, yes. Because that we I've... correct the tilt first, then we measure it. Yes. Right. So, yeah. uh, I mean, at least here in CMC, we become very, very cautious about doing hamstring lengthening. Like from PMR, we, only, we don't do transfers. We only do uh, lengthening procedures. Uh, and, you know, what we have tried to do is, you know, strengthen the muscles very well. And then, you know, if if you have, in spite of, you know, trying all measures, the popliteal angle is still significant. We have, we just do, you know, as minimal procedure, which we get to know when we examine under anesthesia. So then sometimes okay. we just do a medial hamstrings, you know, some amount of medial hamstring and we leave the lateral hamstring because very often we find is the medial hamstring, which is much more tight than the lateral hamstrings. So, how do how do you come across any situation like that when the surgery is a plan for hamstring lengthening, but after doing gait analysis, you found that no, it's not required. It's a contraindication. Have you ever faced such type of situation? Yeah, uh, yeah, you are right. Um, in fact, we have, even without gait analysis, we are able to realize that you know the person is not able to um, the efficiency of walking has come down. And, you know, what we kind of explain sometimes to the patient is, you know, we have tried everything possible to get that knee uh, flexor tightness become better. And uh, the, uh, we're doing it, but remember that it may take a few months for the hip extensors to become strong. Uh, so you're right. And, you know, again, um, uh, also looking at what is happening to the quadriceps because sometimes the quadriceps is not very efficient because the petla is uh, there's a petla alta and the quadriceps yes. mechanism itself is a weak so if you find there are too much particularly crouch gait we find that you know that um, uh, doing a hamstrings when there is uh, also uh, the quadriceps the isolation or the recruitment of uh, quadriceps is weak the quadriceps mechanism is weak can sometimes deteriorate the gait. So you may do more harm than good uh, at times. So uh, uh, the hamstring lengthening, uh, I think 
uh, we should not main things we should not do it very quickly that's 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 the only thing i can think but uh, i'm not really sure whether um, at least here whether we have kind of gone into details about you know which will benefit uh, versus you know in terms of gait analysis how much of popliteal angle or how much of pelvic tilt those details from an instrumental gait analysis are not i don't think we are able to as of it's definitely a more of a clinical uh, decision making than so much of a gait analysis uh, answer as of so, sometimes you said one thing about the vastus lateralis actually uh, we have very poor concept on that what's the exact role of vastus lateralis isolated vastus lateralis okay yeah so again very thank you for asking that because what we have seen no when someone has a uh, when someone walks with a crouched gait you know the cordyceps comes into action because uh, the body is it is uh, it is just to prevent the body from collapsing so ideally the center of gravity uh, i don't know whether i can just go back to that uh, graph let me show you so this there's a lot of lever arm dysfunction that has been described in uh, in um, in uh, gait and um, uh, it'll be very interesting to look at you know how the ground reaction forces change you know we have actually not looked at, i mean there's one of the things which we wanted to study but uh, in a normal gait cycle because the cog is moving so efficiently we are we don't have to use our quadriceps but when we have a knee flexion uh um, uh deformity which can be because of a hamstring tightness or it can be because of the quadriceps which are weak the lever arm um, the ground reaction force moves back and the further it moves away the amount of generation of force uh of the quadriceps to maintain stability is much higher okay. yes. So, yes yes um yeah so yeah so i i mean it may be interesting to see how much uh you know if if we can predict uh which other patients and we will you know who will do more harm uh, again to stabilize the knee knee you need a good hip extensors also the hip extensors also help with this um but is it a posterior capsule problem or is it just a hamstring tightness um yeah those are things and uh, like you said the quadriceps all of these kind of interact and i think the thing in cp that we find is there are a lot of compensatory changes that happen so the person has already learned to walk and adapted to walk with these compensatory changes and then when we go and make uh, early it used to be polio polio you know you used to think 100 times before you make a do a surgical you you plan a surgery so cp again you know um, we have we have to so again you know it is a lot about uh, reviewing the literature as well as the clinical uh, assessment which will tell you about you know how much of uh, uh, knee flexion deformity or weakness of the quadriceps or hip extensors will prevent the i mean where you're breaking the compensation Yes, uh, sometimes situation arises such a way that we actually find difficult. What is the exact reason? For example, right now we have a patient in what? She is an adolescent girl, a suspected case of CP, supposed to be CP, and her quadriceps is fine, uh, four plus, but uh, still she is walking with equinus, uh, complete equinus gait. I mean, uh, he has she has a fixed equinus contracture, but the way she is walking, almost uh, tibia to foot is ninety degree. I mean, one uh, eighty degree. So we are, we are unable to find what is the exact cause of why she is walking like this. this stiff equinus gait. Though of course it's uh, the equinus contracture is there not that much, but uh, for a compensatory purpose, uh, she is walking with a complete equinus gait. Her quadriceps is not uh, less than three; it is four around, but still she is walking with a uh, complete equinus gait. We are not able to find why exactly what is the cause. Maybe it's a compensatory mechanism, and what is the problem for which she is compensating? We are unable to find it because maybe we don't have that gait analysis part. We are lacking that. But Just... is how is the ankle voluntary control? How is the ankle dorsiflexus? Yeah, I, I just put a light throw a light because I have examined the patient. Yes, so, yes please, Abhishek, go ahead. So the that lady, uh, though the history is uh, not sure, we were actually trying to look at whether it was a progressive uh, worsening. 
the parents kind of uh, kind of actually uh, telling all the time that the, she doesn't have a progressive equinus but it was not sure that it was sure that the weakness probably have worsened because she is walking straight almost the she's like a vertical talus like she start talking walking on metatarsal head section yes empty pigeon yes exactly yeah. and then actually when i examined the patient she has a really weak g max so her isolated contraction of uh, uh, gluteus maximus is weak so i have gone ahead and thought that probably this is not a classical cp we have gone ahead and did a mri brain so that the negative predictive value is better so her negative uh, mri brain was actually did not show any abnormality that kinds of makes a red flag sign that probably patient did not have a uh, childhood uh, insult to the brain uh, and uh, we have clinically localized uh this, though she was not having a major sensory loss so one of the differentials we kept was hsp hereditary spastic paraparesis and uh, because probably today the it was off and pavitra sir is not aware actually today the patient happened to meet to neurologist and uh, they have done an ncs and probably they are also thinking in line of hsp so they are kind of ruling out the diagnosis of cp they agreed to our observation this is a typical presentation this child what we are seeing she is a 17 year old lady uh, and uh, she is walking almost complete equinus complete equinus and the no past history and records because the fact that the child does not have any abnormality bubble limb or they don't have any mental retardation even the parents have brought the child such a late age that itself uh, is kind of because usually cp uh, kids yeah, usually does, the gate pattern is not falling in the cp manner the way yeah. see the covered or gate the pattern is not falling on the cp uh, how are the reflexes uh, abhishek how are the reflexes yeah ma'am uh, reflexes are bit brisk on uh, both the sides but again when we go proximally the reflexes are not well elicited she doesn't have planters planters are equivocal so it is a kind of a gray area patient but uh, let's uh, like if we broaden our uh, uh, clinical criteria and we think like it is not a cp but what even if it is hsp what is the biomechanics behind it so i felt that uh, she might be going through a proximal muscle weakness and she has got a atypical compensatory mechanism or maybe more of hsp i tried to look into the hsps which are actually walking in the world or i try to see how they are walking she is kind of uh, the typical tip toe walking gait she has but usually tip toe walking kids uh, they change their gait pattern once they cross 6 years but this uh, girl continued to walk up to 17 years this is very atypical and uh, abhishek as a classical teaching uh, when when some, uh, somebody is having a quadriceps weakness they used to compensate by uh, doing hyperextension knee that uh, they bring the cg to the front of the knee so that their gait can be compensated but here uh, as you uh, said that probably it is the g max is causing this Uh, uh, sir it's not uh, necessarily the g max because i'll tell you she has quadricep weakness also and uh, but plant- i think it is not less than 3 uh, it is not less than 3 it is more than 3 quadricep is more than 3 and g max is less than 3 but the problem is the we can't actually measure the gastro power because it is almost gone into the full equinus so there is hardly any range available right now the question arises now whether to go for equinus correction or not that is the question for this discussion <laughs> so if she is walking with a compensatory gait will go for correction of the equinus so might be the child will not walk and the will be the the gait pattern is very bad just she is walking over the metatarsal pharyngeal joint bilaterally but we are unable to decide whether to go for equinus correction or not yeah i, I again uh, had to speak to the neurologist and he also kind of had the similar opinion he said that uh, she has proximal weakness and he also pointed out that there is some trunk weakness also major which is coming on so uh, i think by tomorrow it will be very interesting to see if they get any uh, positive fasciculation i have not seen the report yet so probably they are looking into that part so if anterior horn is involved then probably surgery becomes kind of out of question because we are going probably to pro- progressive disease so weakness is going to worsen day by day so but only thing is we can probably prevent the harm what we can actually inflict on her abhi say can you take some questions there in the chat box yeah so uh, i request all the participant if they can 
put some questions. I think uh, there is a very healthy discussion or, uh, already. And I think Dr. Mrinal Joshi is asking a question on what about spastic dystonia of plantar flexors? Okay, uh, so spastic dystonia of uh, plantar flexors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so you will again find a recording of gait analysis where you will find plantar flexion and uh, a varus. Uh, and really, it is really a, um, a, a clinical decision. So if you find that uh, in the EMG, the um, muscles are coming on together. So all the tibialis and the gastronemius, when they should, should switch off, both the muscles are coming on together. Uh, you, can, you can say it is dystonia. Uh, but again, because we are not doing EMG of all the muscles, you know, we are not doing tibialis posterior. Uh, we only doing tibialis anterior and gastrocnemius. So, um, if you feel clinically that when a person is walking, the ankle is going into varus and into equinus, uh, then definitely um, um, uh, dystonic posturing. When you're examining the person sitting while sitting and you know asking the person to dorsiflex plantar flex uh, when you and when you look at how it is affecting the gait i think those are things which, which you can uh, assess um, just uh, in a sitting position as well as in a walking position and uh, take a call on you know whether you want to give uh, botox which again is a very good way before you do any kind of surgery um, do a botox and see um, again, I don't know whether uh, whether Dr. Minal, you do any motor point block. Sometimes we should think about you know using a motor point block and seeing what happens. Um, yeah, uh, sir has also commented on that. Uh, like under anesthesia examination will be an important step, and uh, post uh, peripheral or a post peripheral nerve block can be used. Right now, what we are doing in Nirtar is uh, we are be, uh, for judging dystonias. We are kind of trying to give ultrasound guided uh, uh, nerve blocks and later on it can be converted with phenol if required uh, for a motor point block. That's what we are doing right now. I, I think I'll take a, a next question. Uh, Dr. Goro Gomez has asked that, that can it be a hip flexor contracture causing equinus like gait and hip extensor weakness? And the second one is Thomas test in that patient is what? So probably it is talking about the same patient what we discussed. Uh, uh, so the th so far as Thomas test, I can answer it. The Thomas test is negative. The patient does not have any kind of hip flexor contracture. And uh, got the good way of looking at, you know, whether there's a hip flexor contracture. Did you see him do a kneel walk? Yeah, she, she, she yeah. No, we, we, we really, uh, you know, we- we kind of um, think a lot of uh, diagnosis is made just by that kneel walk. You know, that kneel walk itself tells you the hip, there is no hip flexion contraction and the hip extensors are good. So he's not falling forward. Yeah, kneel walking can be a very good test in this particular condition. I have not done, but yes, she is able to uh, kneel, kneel it down. Okay, so, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know which patient we are talking about. I was just... Professor, uh, the, the, he is talking about the same patient, the uh, patient he who is walking the tip of the toes. He she doesn't have any hip flexion contracture. She is nice really walking. Yeah. So Dr. Mrinal has commented that Thomas is a misleading. Uh, probably the word is Thomas is misleading occasionally, and uh, Stalys is better. And Judy said knee walking is important. Yeah. So uh, he also agrees that uh, knee walking can be a very crucial one. So yes, I think everybody uh, can uh, put money on that and knee walking kind of becomes an absolutely essential uh, test uh, because that gives you a very clinical and probably functional evaluation is also. We are we always appreciate for the same principle. The first principle for us is that we for target any surgery around the uh, knee and ankle, we always try to see the body, the status of the kneel walking, how she's working with knee. Yeah, kneel walking here also at Nirta, we are actually kneel walking is becomes a two point kneeling or kneel walking, or even a uh, patient coming and coming to kneel walking is also very good. That gives you a very good trunk control examination as well without doing any touching even the patient. 
Uh, okay. So probably there is no more questions, sir. Yeah, okay. I think time to uh, wind up. So uh, I'll one question is there. Obviously, just for last question, take up that question. Can patellar tendon? So can patellar tendon laxity result in? Uh, once again, uh, can patellar tendon laxity uh, result in incomplete extension and compensatory crouch? Now this yes. one. Yeah. So uh, uh, maybe uh, ma'am can answer. Uh, what yeah. is your opinion? you know I, I mean uh, definitely it can cause because the efficiency of the quadriceps is uh, not good when the patellar tendon is lengthened i'm sure there are a lot of people dr minnal and everybody else can also kind of uh, comment on that yeah as a crouch management uh, we have to see the both the uh, i mean balance around the knee joint regarding the uh, spasticity of the quadricep at the same time also uh, so spasticity of the hamstring at the same time also power of the quadricep. So both the things should be uh, taken care of. Uh, so at the time uh, we have to really uh, and reduce the spasticity by surgery or other method. At the same time also we have to augment the uh, quadricep. There are a number of methods are there for augmenting quadricep. So most of most of the times we uh, try to correct uh, augmentation of the quadricep by shortening the patellar tendon and uh, strengthen the quadricep. The power, uh, the, there is a high uh, riding patella or patella alta. There we go for uh, augment uh, this uh, shortening of the patella tendon or patella application procedure, ligament and patella application procedure. If it is uh, patella alta is not there, but quadricep is still weak, then we can go for strengthening of the quadriceps. Okay, so it has been real wonderful discussion uh, i think uh, it's a uh, time to wrap up the discussion so i will thank uh, dr judy ma'am to be uh, always be supportive to us and uh, has a very great uh, support in ie to all pgs and she has been very kind to uh, because i have been her student and has been uh, getting a chance to get uh, for some years i was a colleague also maybe our junior colleague but thank you so much ma'am for joining us and looking forward uh, for future that uh, you can join and uh, enlighten us about most of many other topics and uh, from your department as well. I thank Dr. Mrenal, Dr. Pavitra sir for being with us throughout the presentation. And I also thank all participants on behalf of APMRO and SPNETA for joining the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining with us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mrenal sir. Have a good weekend. Bye.